Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with uh, photojournalist Franck Fournier. Franck uh, has uh, been working at a high level. He's won more awards. He's just the guy that uh, is so quiet that you never hear from him, but now we get to all hear from him. Hi, Frank. Hi, Ken. Nice to see you. Great to see you. What are you, what are you working on right now? Uh, well, finishing a project. Uh, I have been putting my archive together and I'm finishing a project on uh, uh, AIDS uh, during the first 10 years of AIDS from 1983 to 1991 or 92. Uh, that's something I need to do. There's a lot of data. Um, it's not only pulling the pictures, but pulling the fact, pulling the, uh, the text, pulling, uh, you know, writing about it, how we happened, what happened. Uh, just trying to put together all this work. I have done basically everything else. That's the last part I have to do. It's a, it's a big part also. So um, basically you started that in like 80, 81? No, uh, it was more like 83, in 83? September 83. Okay. In September 83, there was some kind of article at the time um, in New York Times. Uh, that there was this illness uh, that was affecting uh, very few people. Uh, we're talking about 100 people within the New York area and, and, and few other places. Uh, it was very difficult uh, for the medical team to figure out exactly what's going on. There was a lot of confusion. And they didn't know if it was a form of cancer or was, you know, it was really difficult in the beginning to, to, to grasp the issue medically. And um, so, and then I start to work uh, really shooting uh, in the spring of 1984. So it was uh, two photographers, you and Alon Reiniger from Contact Press Images jumped on this immediately before it, really anyone even knew. I think yep. Alon was, Alon heard rumors just talk no, in it's, the gay it's, community uh, before that, that story mm -hmm. appeared, right? Alon's wife, uh, Shora Cohen, who, uh, who is a custom designer in, in, on movie set, um, was friend with Larry Kramer. She had a lot of friends in the gay community. And one of the friends, uh, um, was Larry Kramer, the, the playwright, um, the activist, and he had dinner, uh, you know, they had dinner at, at their place. And uh, during the dinner, Larry said, you guys don't understand these things, the New York Times talk, nobody wants to talk about it because the consequences are enormous. Um, it's going to spread through everything through the army, through the heterosexual, through everywhere. There's no way you can stop that. And it's going to be a disaster and nobody wants to face the fact. So then I start to understand better the situation. And because of the enormity of work we had to do, uh, the first people who got, who got uh, caught in, in the public in general were the uh, hemophiliac people uh, because of, of the transfusion uh, to, uh, and, um, so Alan basically start to work on a gay community and I start to work on family, children, women, and we basically somehow split the work because it was too much to do for one person to do everything. And we got busy uh, for the next, and we did that for about two years. Um, European publication, Perry Match among them, start to publish about a year, year and a half after we started. But um, in America, it took Crockettson to start to, uh, uh, to, make, uh, to make big wave here in America. No, I, th I think that uh, you probably didn't get published until halfway 85. through 85 in the yeah, US? Yeah, 85, July 85. July in July 85. 85 Rockettson came back from Paris home uh, into the, to Los Angeles, I believe, uh, where he died a few weeks or months before, uh, a few weeks before, after that. And um, 
uh, I start to work here. I got an assignment from New York Magazine here. Uh, Alan got some some stuff also to do, and um, and it start to to go really fast. Time Magazine gave me also use some of the work. New York Magazine used uh, gave me the, an assignment to work on on Victor Bender, who was uh, this son of a doctor here in in, in New York, who. Uh, was on the terminal stage of AIDS, and he uh, was also an advocate and very courageous, very, uh, uh, very, uh, very interesting guy. And so I did a few pictures, you know, for 24, 48 hours with him, and we became friends or whatever. But New York Magazine published the the story and. Three days later, he was in Stern. Stern wanted the whole story, <laughs> and he ended up by being a cover story in Stern. You know. So you um, you were you were working on this, you and Alan, and Bob, and you know, pretty every, everybody in the office had a, had a hand in this. But that's right. you were working on this for three years before you saw any ink in the United States. Just oh, that's right. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. It was. We all uh, Alan invested an enormous amount of time. Alan Reininger invested an enormous amount of time and uh, and work really very seriously. Work uh, with doctors, work with uh, uh, researcher, work with epidemiologists, work with uh, uh, pediatrician, works with every kind of people. He worked on the West Coast, on the here on the East Coast. He went even he went everywhere as well. He did an enormous at the same time. He, he it was a way to portray. Uh, the gay community as well, you know, to portray what's going on because politically they were very interesting. They were doing a lot of very courageous work to uh, to get respected. Remember, it's only a few years after uh, the issue of, um, you know, on, on that happened in 1969 in New York, you know, and the bar. Um, so, so that Stone, was really... Stonewall. Stonewall, exactly. And um, and so so uh, uh, so that was a very uh, they were quite incredible, uh, you know, politically, and and they were incredibly courageous. They had a massive demonstration blocking uh, blocking uh, very very active, very uh, very forceful in the and and they were right because uh, that was their life, and nobody at the time wanted to. Uh, you know, politicians say, yes, yes, we're going to, to address the issue. And then, you know, and then after the speech, they didn't do anything. So they were really pushing people and they lobby people, uh, not only in New York, but in Washington. And that had a very good consequence. So this period was very interesting, journalistically speaking, and uh, because you were inside that community and, and uh, uh, you know, it was quite appealing in many, in many ways. So you studied before you became a photographer. You were you were in medical school in France. And yes. Did this training? The I mean, you helped a lot of people through your photography. It's probably was uh, unexpected that uh, you know, as a photographer, you could help people like a, a doctor would help people. What what did your what did your father say about that? For example, <laughs> my father was. Thought that was stupid to spend his, uh, my life pushing on a button. <laughs> so it was not. I was really the black sheep in the family. Well, none of the fact I was trying to to take. I, I needed oxygen. I needed to get away from him. He was very imposing, very uh, dominating, and and I needed to escape, which is one of the reasons I, I left medical school. He never, he, he never came too. around. He never came around as he saw what you were accomplishing with, with, with uh, just pushing a button. He stopped to, he stopped to realize the impact when I got a, a stupid price of with a world press, uh, world press, uh, world press for, uh, photo. What is as as stupid as stupid prizes go, the world. No, press no, no. It, I, I am, I am one. very. I was very. <laughs> Meaning, I was. It's just a ridiculous. It's a prize, you know. It's and and uh, it's nice. It's very nice to be recognized by your peer. It's very. I was very appreciative of that, but at the same time, one feels very awkward because you receive an award 
for photograph and there's this situation in which you, you spend your life with this, this discrepancy is very, uh, very disturbing. Anyhow, my father basically started to uh, realize that, you know, my name was in newspaper and there was television interview and, and all these things and that, that impressed him. That, uh, and I went to Amsterdam and that evening it's, they opened the, the, uh, uh, they, they take you on, a, on different uh, canals, you know, and it's very beautiful. And then they say, well, we open, the whole city is light up on this uh, tonight because of, of your son award and blah, blah, blah. So he was very impressed when he saw that. He went to Amsterdam to see me receiving the prize. So that was a big, uh, uh, a big deal for him. But uh, I don't think he ever grasped uh, the implication of the work we're doing and how it's being done. Or at least he never shared it with me. So um, speaking, you, you mentioned how uh, it's always it's always kind of weird to win an award for um, your work when you're dealing with such serious subjects. Uh, tell me about uh, Omira. Oof, that's a long story. But basically, it's I have a very different perspective than people may think. Or, or believe uh, uh, because Omaira, uh, I met I met Omaira on Saturday morning. Uh, the volcano exploded around eleven forty-five. The, the the enormous amount of water and and uh, whatever sand and hot sand and all that uh, came down and in the valley and wiped out the city. And I met Omaira around 6.30 um, on, on Saturday morning. So about almost three days, two and a half days after he happened. She had been trapped with enormous amount of cement wall that were crushing her leg. And uh, there were several layers. It was impossible to, uh, to do that. Uh, because uh, they were very confused, uh, there were no crane, there was no bulldozer, there was no uh, anything that could uh, mechanical, uh, uh, you know, uh, could help and 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 do and do the work to remove uh, this. And it does not take much, but no human being could do. Even 10, there was about 10 or 15 people there. 10 or 15 people could not lift this, uh, this um, wall. Now, the second thing, imagine if that has happened, if they were, we were able to remove the wall because the, her leg were crushed, um, the circulation uh, was blocked. And because the circulation was blocked for more than two hours, the blood become poisonous. And if you release uh, uh, quickly any pressure, then the toxin from the blood, and I believe the especially the potassium, uh, will go straight to your heart and within five to 10 minutes you will be dead. So it needs to be done through creating an artificial pressure with balloon uh, by, um, you know, med uh, medical team who are very uh, experienced in this kind of issue. Uh, firemen, uh, army people uh, are trained to do that. And then slowly you release uh, uh, the pressure at the same time you inject the person with uh, proper, uh, proper uh, medication. So to save her would have been uh, even in, in, in uh, if it happened in New York, to save her would have been a real challenge. Um, that being said, I think the whole, it's interesting because this photograph and what happened there is being, um, it's, it's not seen the proper way because Colombia, even they have a lot of money from drugs, had a very poor budget, very low budget, and they have also 
um, no geologist, no volcanologue, or they had one geologist, but no volcanologue, nobody who knew uh, volcano. And it's a little bit kind of strange because uh, this is a country with 15 active volcano. So in order for, uh, uh, you need to, to, to follow the volcano, you need to understand that, you need to have a, li a little bit of equipment. So the Colombian are connected with the American and ask, we need about a uh, few uh, um, equipment, piece of equipment that could transmit the amount of gas released by the volcano, the uh, measure, the, uh, the tremor of the ground. You know, you don't need that much, but you need about uh, seventy-five to $120,000 uh, worth of equipment that is being put there. And of course, when they ask, uh, when they ask the Americans, the Americans say, oh, we have a budget problem. We cannot give that to you. Although it would have benefited the American to, uh, to send the equipment with a volcanologue for a few days teaching and training the people to do that. So that was refused. It was refused by the English. It was refused by the French. It was refused by the United Nations. Everybody first ran for months. And basically a year after the, the Colombian government uh, has reached different countries to solve the issue, trying to understand uh, how to warn the population in Armero and on the villages on the slope of the volcano, nobody came up. And the cost of solving uh, this issue uh, and preparing the, the population will be around $160,000, providing 20,000, 28,000 people with not 28,000, but probably in some 20,000 flashlight does not cost a lot of money. And training people three or four times during the night, because it always happened during the night, it always happened when it rained, it always happened because uh, the local, uh, you know, it's, there's always, uh, uh, it's linked with a volcano and, and uh, it's, there's no visibility because often there's cloud of ash. So if you train people to go to the hill, which were within a couple of football field as a distance. So anyone anywhere in the city could reach several hill within a couple of football field with a flashlight. They will lose uh, their belongings, but they will have life. And on this hill, you could have station there, water, food, or whatever. And in the morning, people can always work it out from this, the top of the hill. Instead, uh, the, the American, the French, the English, uh, everyone, the Italian, the Swiss, the Japanese sent a full uh, orthopedic uh, uh, surgery uh, uh, with uh, surgeons uh, also to, to Colombia. And they spent millions and millions of dollars with helicopters and all these things to save dead people. And that's really upsetting because if everybody had contributed a little bit, then you could have prevented all these deaths. So this is really a real nonsense. You know, and it's, when this situation happened, it's hard somehow to convey because the press report, this is what happened to this little girl, this is what happened to, uh, uh, you know, to these people and so on and but if you know they don't really report our guilt you know in refusing to help people and prevent them and then what's stupid is later on we will spend millions of dollars with with helicopters with help with uh, uh, it does not make sense to me but it makes sense for them because it's kind of advertising and it makes good uh, you know american look good french look good uh, you know well, the uh, the frustration you're 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 expressing it's kind of the age old frustration of every every photojournalist. It's we're always um, we're always photographing the aftermath. We're never photographing, uh, rarely photographing the things that lead up to the situation that makes the uh, makes the pictures. Yeah. So what to tell me? Tell I mean this was. 
you told me the story, I mean, just to get into the, just so people realize, you you went there, you didn't have an assignment to go to Columbia, you saw that there was a, a volcano and you just got on a plane, right? Oh, I, that morning I was visiting Victor Bender, I was mentioning earlier that I was photographing him, I went to visit him in hospital because he was not doing well. So around nine o'clock or eight thirty, I was at the hospital with him and I spent a couple of hours with him, you know, trying to cheer him up, uh, whatever, you know, spend time with him. And um, I came back home, it was about 11.15. And at the time we had answering machine because there was no cellular phone. So on the answering machine, there was a message saying, well, this is contact Robert Pledge. Uh, there's a volcano who has exploded in, in, uh, in uh, Colombia, South America. Uh, it would be good if you can go. I, live in, I called them back right away saying I'm going. And I left for the airport and made the 12 o'clock plane. I booked a ticket, I made the 12 o'clock, I really moved fast. <laughs> um, I had to change. I changed plane in Miami because I want. I had. I could save an half an hour or forty-five minutes. Uh, uh, so I changed plane. And between changing plane, I placed a phone call to contact and saying, "Well, you know, I don't cover volcano every day. So what is going on down there? What am I supposed to? Uh, what do you have any leads?" And, and Robert say, "Well, what do you think you're going down there to tell us? We don't know. You're going to tell us." <laughs> All right, thanks. So <laughs> I say, is there any fume? Because I'm aware, you know, I, my only knowledge I have is from my, you know, secondary school or whatever it's called, high school, where you, you know, they tell you, you know, you have gas, hot gas, 3,000 degree gas, who come down, they're invisible, they, they burn everything, you disappear, you know, you don't see them coming, uh, and so on, and then they saw lava and all that. I had no idea what I was going to do. And I arrived down there um, in in uh, in Bogota. I, it was straight. I went straight to the hotel. And in the hotel, of course, I went on my own because I was not an assignment. I didn't know uh, anything. And in the hotel, I was. Uh, I saw Bernie Diedrich. Bernie Diedrich died. Uh, about four days ago, a week ago. He's a, a wonderful photo, uh, reporter, uh, writer for the Time magazine. He had been working in Central America, in the Caribbean, especially in Haiti. Um, I knew him. I had uh, uh, worked a little bit with him in Central America. Um, he is a wonderful guy. And he said, Frank, this is what we're going to do. You're going to leave. There's about four and a half hours drive to to the place. Uh, we pay, pick up a taxi. You will arrive by early morning. But I need to see you at one o'clock in this little airport, about an hour from uh, from the place where there will be a plane where the film will be shipped. It was a. Uh, I, fl I flew on a Thursday night, so I had only Friday morning, and at the time. I needed to work from 6.30 basically until one o'clock. I had to drop the film at one o'clock for Time Magazine. So, and I knew Perry Match will close by uh, Sunday night, Monday morning latest. So I, uh, I gave my film, you know, I shot as much as I could and whatever I could, but I was never at the heart of Armero uh, for the few hours because only to reach Armero from the drop off of the car, you need two and a half hour walk. So it's because everything was cut off, the road were cut off. Uh, and on the path, you will find a lot of refugees and a lot of people walking, you know, traumatized in bad needs of help. And there's, there was basically no help or very little at the time, at least on that path that I took later on. So. Um, it was very challenging in many ways, you know. So I I, uh, I brought back the film and then I gave at one o'clock and then I was on on my own for another day because I needed to make the the four o'clock plan for the flight to Paris uh, on Saturday. 
So I had another 24 hours to work. So I worked quite hard that, uh, that evening. And then in the morning, early in the morning, around uh, three or four in the morning, I went, um, I walk uh, in the night uh, to reach the, uh, the, the site of Armero. So I could be there when the sun rises. You know, when, when you have film, it's different of digital. You didn't have the, the sensitivity you could use. You could use 400 ASA, 800 ASA, maybe 1600, but then it start to be very grainy and not very nice. So I was waiting for the day to rise around six o'clock, 6.15. And that's when I managed to reach Armero. But I was on my own at the time and I didn't know I was working for time. So that Sunday morning, you finally re found her. Uh, Saturday morning, I found Saturday her. morning. So, yeah. so let me just get this straight. You, you, Thursday morning, you were uh, you were in, in the York. hospital with an yeah. AIDS victim. You know, just kind of meeting meeting him just to cheer him up, as you said. Yeah. You got in a phone call about eleven in the morning. You got 11 on 11.15, I had a phone call. I, I came home and I got my, 11.15, uh, uh, I got on my answering machine, yeah. Right, so you got on a, a 12 noon flight to Miami. That's right, change plan. And so you get into Bogota Thursday. About midnight. About midnight, okay. By midnight. You meet Bernie Dietrich, you see Bernie in the in the hotel lobby and so you get a plan for the next day which right i see look we had i had some kind of meeting around 1 30 or 2 in the morning with him and then and you then, left you got a you got a cab about what two in the morning to get there 1 32 yeah so you immediately get into a cab after talking to bernie yeah that's right and you get there you get to the you get two and a half hours away from the site of the volcano uh, at about when the sun comes up. That's right. You shoot, you walk two and a half hours in, you walk two and a half hours out, and you get to a small regional airport by one right. in the afternoon. That's right. That film goes to New York City. That's right. You turn around, you get back in your cab, and you go up the hill again. I, 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 go, I, go, I turn around and I go and I shoot more, yes. Right. So you're going, you're going back to the site and you're going to shoot, uh, you walk through the night. So That's you're right. there uh, Saturday morning, early in the morning. Yes, but I must have been there a little bit before by 5.30, but I couldn't shoot until, I couldn't shoot really until 6 o'clock. There was no way I could shoot. There Close wasn't enough light, but no, you were there. Enough light. Yeah. You walked through the night, you drove through the night, you shoot for what till about noon then you have to get back you have to walk back to get your cab right and um drive to the regional airport now your film's going to paris no no it's going to oh for, for the second day yeah, uh, yeah. no the, the second day the thing on day happened much better as i was with 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 omira um it was bad. Uh, six thirty to about oh my right died about nine fifty sixteen in the morning, but I was not alone. There was also a photographer. There was photographer from Sigma. There was photographer from Gamma. There was photographer from SIPA. There was photographer from Rex Photo Agency. Uh, there was many um, photographers there, um, and at one point, as I was, we were shooting. Um, at one point, somebody say, uh, I'm leaving, I have to make the four o'clock plane. So he came to me and he said, do you want me, do you want to give me your film? And, you know, and ask your agency to pick them up on Sunday morning in Paris. And I said, oh, that's really sweet of you. Thank you. So I gave my film to, to the first guy. And then um, 20 minutes later, there's another guy who say, well, I have to make that flight to Paris. Do you have anything? I had another roll or two. So I give another roll or two to that guy. And then there's a third guy uh, who, who say, 
hey, I'm going to Paris, I'm going back. Here's 10 walls of film, you will need it, I don't need them. Here's 10 walls of, of Fuji film, whatever it was, uh, Velvia, uh, not uh, what did you, 100, RBP. Oh, God, this film was good too. Yeah, it was a good film. And so, so I, I gave that, uh, he gave me these 10 walls. I gave him my, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my film to a third guy. And so that was a third shipment. So it, was, it worked, you know, it worked out perfect because I could stay there. For me, even if I was not making the, a Paris brand, I would never have left Omaira because these people had to leave because they have two and a half walk, uh, hour to walk back to, to the cab. And then they had another four and a half hours drive to, uh, to reach uh, Bogota airport. So it was not an easy ride, you know. And I was not going to, uh, uh, I was not going, I wanted to stay with her. I didn't want to leave. So I, I would not have made the deadline if, if nobody has taken my film. So, you know, this is something very important, you know. We're competitive with each other. We like to do a better work than, than your friend. But we help each other. And I always, always been held by by my friends, you know, always. Yeah, I wanted to. I mean, to, physically, I just wanted... um, you know, they, they fed me, they, uh, they, uh, they gave me, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, either a bed or a sofa or whatever. They, they helped me with films, they helped me technically, they helped me carry my films. They do, I mean, there's such, you know, there's really a very strong relationship. Uh, at least that's what I experienced. Uh, with uh, with my f uh, other uh, friends, I never had any issue. I hope at least I don't remember. No, it's it's very it's 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 important to stress because we are kind of uh, talking about the history of the medium and how people worked. And like you said, all your competitors are there. All these other wire services, uh, not wire service, but agencies, they're working for the magazines primarily, and they're uh you're working together you're helping each other out and then i think even uh so the next morning so now it's sunday morning didn't you didn't you bring a, some tv crews and some other photographers back or how did that work well on sunday morning uh i work i work uh on sunday on Sunday, I, I went back to Bogota and slept because I was tired. <laughs> I was starting to be, to be very tired. You know, I don't remember, and I was starving, and I was thirsty <laughs> because there's no food, you know? It's not like you, have, you, you can pop a dollar and get a Coke, you know? <laughs> so it's, it was really, uh, I was like, you know, you, you're very tired. And I remember when I was shooting Romario, I was so tired that I had to, to push by one stop because I knew I was shaking from being starved and being uh, tired. You know, physically, you, 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 I was not as... Physically, you were spent. You've been up for probably three days now straight. You've right, walked, basically, right. You've walked so, tens so, of miles back and yeah, forth in the yeah. mud. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, Tuesday, you, we, you, you didn't look very pretty. And so but Sunday you slept, you rested. Sunday night, yeah. Yeah. Sunday night I slept. And then and I rested and I took a shower, which is always great. And then um and then basically um I went back on Monday morning, you know. And then by Monday morning I managed to organize myself and uh be um stay in the within the vicinity. Uh, I was able to find the driver was wonderful, and you know, we never, never. Uh, I don't know. We, it's, we never give enough credit to to the people, the drivers, the people who help you, the local people who who direct you, who show you, who share the the grief and 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 all these things. And then in the middle of that, they they want people to know what happened to them, so they. They're incredibly helpful, at least uh, they, that's my experience. 
Yeah, you bring up a good point. The the when you're when you're in these tragic, ongoing crisis situations, the people that are closest to the tra tragedy, um, they're they're kind of you know people think oh look at that evil photographer he's he's shooting pictures of these people and they're suffering. They're they're the first ones that want their picture made. Is that true in your experience? In a, yeah, in a sense, it's 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 very important to report to report what's going on because if you don't say what's going on, then people abuse because there's always people there ready to abuse. That one of the aspect of you know, Colombians are like everybody else, but one of the aspect of uh, during this volcano, another story that one could have worked on, is in the middle of that. Uh, situation, many children were separated from their parents through the, uh, during that catastrophe, during that uh, eruption. And um, people had no problem taking these children and giving them to Christian family within the region of Chicago and within the, uh, in Holland and so on. And now, people in Colombia, uh, thanks to DNA, are able to trace back some of these children, you know, who were taken, sold for money uh, by local uh, thief. So, you know, if you don't report, people see, oh, how come this staff uh, did pull out this little girl? Why, what, uh, you, know, you know, this guy is sick. How come he didn't do that? Well, you know, I have a camera or a status stuff, but you, nobody can do anything. You need equipment. You need, you need people with experience and knowledge. You don't save people uh, by just pulling out of the water and carrying them to a hospital. It's unfortunately, you need experienced people uh, with equipment. You know, you need equipment and there was none. And uh, again, uh, you know, people need, it needs to be reported, it needs to be seen, it needs to be heard. That's how we progress, that's how we make better, you know. So 25 years ago, we were having a conversation, and you had a story uh, in, that you were trying to pursue, you're working very hard on it. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, rape victims in Serbia. Do you yes. remember this story? Yes, 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 very much so. And so at, at 25 years ago, people, uh, if they know their history, they'll realize that there uh, was a, a big trial going on, the O.J. Simpson trial. That's right. Now, you went to probably all these magazines, all these magazines that know you, they respect your work, they're, uh, you have a relationship with them, you've won awards for them. Um, what did they say when you uh, were trying to, to get some uh, money to go to Serbia? Well, I don't remember, but I, I rent a car. <laughs> I didn't ask for money. Or did it, nobody give me any money. I don't know. But I don't remember exactly. Well, I mean, what, what you told me is that they, 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 uh, they didn't have any money for you to go to Serbia and photograph rape victims right. from, uh, yes. as war crimes. That's right. But if you wanted to go to LA, they could, uh, you could, you could, you could shoot the OJ Simpson trial for them. Oh yes, that I that I could do. Nice dog. <laughs> uh, oh, it's a cat. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, that's Frederick. Oh, Frederick! What a nice yeah. name. <laughs> Very noble, <laughs> Frederick. Um, yeah, no, you know, maybe I work differently. Um, maybe I got. I, I got a guarantee usually when I, a financial guarantee when I reach the site um, of work. And um, uh, I left, uh, I went to uh, Yugoslavia by renting a car from Paris. So I rent a car from Paris. And yes, I know it's kind of strange. But it's, it was not easy because you go to a war zone. So I went to Hertz, I got my car. <laughs> what, what, you, never, you never tell Hertz where you're going in that situation, do you? No, no, <laughs> neither when you come back. <laughs> it's 
especially when you come back. <laughs> because the car was, had window missing and there was full of hole <laughs> from shrapnel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I was, I was, uh, I told them there was a bomb in, in Milano at the gas station in Milano. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, the car looked, it was a brand new car. It was, a, it was, it was a, uh, I don't know, 2000 mile, not even brand new, uh, brand new car. And yeah, but I, I didn't know it would, I mean, I knew it would be muddy, but I didn't realize. Yeah, because at the time you, in order to reach the site, you have to go through slope. You have, you have to go through slope. There's no roads, you know. Right. You put the chain on the on the car, and you go through uh, weird places through the through the woods. You know, it's not uh, it's not always a straight line. You know, it's not highway. You know. <laughs> and then when I arrive in the, when I arrive in the, in Sarajevo, I, f I find somebody who told me, oh, that's easy. You go over there, you go over there, you go around the airport. And then when you, when you price, uh, arrive near the airport, you go full speed as <laughs> fast as you can. <laughs> and sure enough, when, <laughs> and, you know, I had, had, uh, <laughs> they were shooting, the <laughs> you could hear shooting and I was like going fast. Now it was in January and it was damn icy. And I was like, I'm never going to break. How am I going to find, you know? And at the end, there was a, a right angle with a, a really a piece of a, a lot of earth, you know, to protect the, some guards that was there. And I show up and my car went on every spinning and doing all the same. But the good thing is it was four o'clock in the afternoon. And by that time, they had so much beer and so much uh, drunk that, I was saved by because they couldn't, couldn't shoot straight. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I was oh. stupid because I knew there would be no gas in Sarajevo. So what I did, I, I put some 80 gallons worth of, ga of gas. Which I, and after that, I said, oh, that's not very smart. Is that? <laughs> that, could have been, that could have been a nice uh, uh, film effect, you know, like, oh, if they have reached the dam. Uh, the damn car. Mm. So yeah. So that's so that I went to, to Sarajevo. But I, I went to Wanda the same way. I went with frequent mileage to Wanda. I was on my way to South Africa. And then because of the situation in Wanda. So the genocide in Rwanda, you got yeah. there on frequent flyer miles? Yes, on frequent flyer miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had to talk to, to Robert Stevens' wife to tell him that, that Time Magazine could at least pay me my airfare line because they didn't want to pay me my, air, my expenses. When they, they gave me some money, they, they get the cover and I got a cover and eight or 10 pages, which is kind of eight or 10 photographs or 12 photographs over six or eight pages. That was quite a, an amazing spread. You're not usual the case in Time Magazine. And Michelle Stevenson was wonderful. I mean, she, they did a good job. But uh, when I said to Robert Stevens, you didn't even pay me my airfare ticket. And he said, why should I? <laughs> you already pay for it. <laughs> so I talked to his wife telling him, you know, you better give him a hard time. <laughs> and his wife, and then two days later, I got the job done. <laughs> the the deal I needed was paid. <laughs> Thank you know, you. That's, that's, that's a great point because what people don't realize, you think these are the, these are the editors, the big magazines, they control, you know, so many aspects of, of what I, what I'm able to do. And I, I was always frustrated with editors and I, and I said this to, to Gio Perez and he said, don't talk to him in the office, wait till you see him at a cocktail party and then make him feel terrible, make him feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and it works, so right? Uh, you, he's, he looks, he, well, I, I, I met Alex in the street, and his wife, and she was very nice. And uh, I knew her from before. And we had come and friend, and, and she's very nice. I'll say, I will talk to Robert. And it's sure enough, two days later, I got a call. Oh, Robert wants you to send the uh, photocopy of the airline ticket. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, so, and, and no, go ahead. What were you going to say? They have budget, you know, they, they limited in budget every time they squeeze, but our expenses are so minimum, so minimum, you know, what we spend in food and lodging, it's so minimum. It's no, I think, you know, and that, that you bring up a great point, you know, one of the, one of the, the tricks, you know, is, is when you're working for Time Magazine, if you were flying over five hours, it was a rule that you could upgrade to business class. And oh, I so, didn't know. right. And so what I we would, know. you didn't, didn't know, do that. No. <laughs> okay, well, what, what you do, and so I learned this trick from Alon, who we talked about a little earlier. Alan Reiniger, he says, what you do is you uh, you buy the business class ticket and you make a copy of that and then you turn that ticket in and get a regular, you know, uh, tourist ticket. Right. And so you make about $1,000 on your ticket and then you use that to, to pay for stuff that the magazine won't pay for. No, that I have done that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an old <laughs> trick, right? No, it's an old trick that I have done that. Yeah. So speaking of 25 years ago, I was, this might be 30 years ago at this point, we've known each other for a while, but um, I was very frustrated and I was uh, working as hard as I, I could. And I said, Frank, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm working as hard as I can. And uh, you said, do you remember what you said to me? Yeah, don't chance? work hard, work smart. You now you said work hard. You said work as hard as you can, but also work as smart as you can. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You have to work smart. Sometimes, sometimes you have to take a step back. Uh, you have sometimes you have to take a step back in order to do uh, to understand what's going on. If you're too close, too in the middle, sometimes you work hard, you miss the point. You need to to have that step back. You know, just to understand what's going on, so you can go back into it. You know, to have that, if you don't have an understanding of what you're doing, you know, it's not about compelling pictures, it's about telling the story. And that's why I don't like to work, uh, I don't like to work an assignment for time. I really work an assignment for time. When you work an assignment for time or for anybody, I really work an assignment because when you work an assignment, you have somebody in some office who has some kind of information. Now they have whatever internet, or at the time they had CNN. And they tell you, you should go here, you should do that, you should do this. And by the time they close, this story became less relevant than new story coming up. And that these people cannot know because they are not on the ground. And if you're a good journalist, I'd rather go on my own. Matter of fact, I remember um, Teddy uh, uh, at Time Magazine, he told me that 5% of his work was published. Only 5% of his work was published. Most of his assignment was never published. And he was on staff at Time Magazine. I was working as a freelance and 95, 99% of my work was published because when I worked to assignment, I could figure out the story. I could understand the story. I could. Uh, foresee who was important, do the things, do them. And then when I, as long as I could make the shipment and have the film deliver on time, then we could do okay. You know, oh, we, we, we brought this, 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 this subject came up in, I think the last issue, the last episode, maybe like episode 28 of Talking Pictures. And as, as an agency photographer, say you get to wherever Sarajevo and you get a your your agency comes back with an assignment for you from a magazine it could be stern it could be perry match it could be time it could be wherever but you had to kind of weigh out whether you wanted to accept that assignment because as soon as you accept their assignment they're going to say oh go stand on this street corner this is where the picture is going to happen that's right and, and just like like bob told you when when you called up from miami you're on your way to bogota and you called up Bob Pledge in the Office of Contact Press Images, and you're like, what am I going to find down there? And his answer was, that's, you know, you're the that's journalist. Why you go, that's why we send you. Do right. it. Tell us. Let's find and out. Then, right, right. And so, yeah. 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 And that's, well, but that's the interesting part of the work, you know, 
is to be doing to be able to do that. You just brought up an, another point that I'd like to just recognize. You you said um, it's not about making the pictures; it's about telling the story. And so, as photographers, you know, we always want to show off and show how you know how fantastic a, of a photographer we are. You know, we want to show off, but that doesn't really serve oftentimes that doesn't really serve the story. It doesn't serve the subject matter. It's about telling that story. And it could be a lot of uh, smaller pictures, less, less dramatic pictures that actually tell that story. First, you don't play with people. You know, you cannot play with people to make art with people. You don't do this kind of things. You, you, you tell the story. You, you try to understand. You try to show... Uh, understand the, the compassion, understand the situation, understand uh, what's happening to them, why it's happening, who is behind it, what is, what, the why, the what, the how, the who, and, and so on. Um, that's what you're after. I'm not saying that I'm not sensitive to light. Of course I'm sensitive to light. Of course if I can pull, I can use a Kodak home because it would be better and nicer and better color or uh, the RDP, the Fuji uh, RDP the, from uh, uh, the 100 uh, ASA film. Of course I will do it. Of course I'm sensitive to, to a nice light. Uh, that's something that is important. But if I can use that light to show the point, that the situation, then, then that's when I'm successful. You know, the light should help me to, to to underline, to put what is what is is going on and what it's about. The you light know, is the the light yeah, is another it, tool to use to tell your story. That's right, and that's one of the problems with the digital is that you lose that sensitivity of light. You lose it. You know, the digital gives you great great work, especially at night, in the evening, early morning. It's it's just phenomenal, but during the day. It's not there yet to me, for me. It's not as, as it's not Kodak Home yet. Something you brought up with, uh, with the, the, the Columbia uh, volcano, this idea that you couldn't, you had to wait for the light. You had to wait an extra hour just for the light to arrive. Mm -hmm. um, there is this, and I don't, I don't want to like sound too, uh, to uh, like old, old man, but um, we don't, photographers, uh, digital, they don't, they don't look at light the way they used to. I don't think. Yeah, but because they don't have to. <laughs> it's, it's different. It's, it's just different. I, I will have digital at, in Colombia when I was there. I'm sure I will have shot during the night. I will have tried to find a way to shoot during the night. Um, it's well you try to exploit whatever situation i think you know uh, uh, yes I, I still like the old film <laughs> <It's him. laughs> so so speaking of which you have maybe uh, i like I, I, with the old film was youth and and interesting story and possibilities that were so maybe i mixed everything <laughs> Well, you have, uh, speaking of Kodachrome and light, you have uh, a gallery show opening this week in San Francisco at the Leica Gallery. Right. Uh, I, have a, I have a few images I'd like to share if that's um, okay with you. Of course, yeah. Hopefully this will work. I'm always a little dicey when I try to share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yes. So Kodachrome, as we know, as us old men know, um, was all, was the most beautiful red in the world. And I think this is uh, kind of the anchor you used to, to, for this uh, gallery show, correct? Right, yes. But I realized only after that there was a lot of red. I didn't pick that up when I shot. You know, I shot because for whatever the reason I was, uh, but I, uh, 
you know, it, yeah. But looking back in retrospect, you see that red yes, showing yes. up where you don't expect it. It's always, it was like a constant that, that you found in, in this edit. It's and very so, vivid, uh, yes. So what do you, tell me your techniques here. What are you shooting with and what, what's your... My technique is that I, I am working as an assistant. Uh, for, uh, when I arrived in New York, um, I, uh, I went from the airport. I had the list of names. Uh, and uh, I went straight from the airport to the staffer uh, that was on the list, on the top of the list. So that was Jerry Abramovitz. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so two hours later, uh, I got a job there as an assistant somehow. And um, I worked uh, for three or four months with him, five months with him. And um, in between, uh, I was picking up some film. And on my way to pick up some film, uh, uh, I shot that with, uh, uh, from the windshield, there was a heavy rain and I felt sorry for this poor guy and had the impression that, uh, you know, it, it was like in an history book, you know, where the slave was still working, nothing has changed. So this is, uh, this is New York City basically in the, the late in the 70s? In 1977, yeah. Late 70s, right. So you're shooting what, uh, you're mainly Kodachrome, I think? Yeah, mainly Kodachrome, yeah, only a Kodachrome at the time. And I shot, um, I shot that uh, from the windshield of the, of the, of the bus I was driving to go pick up the film. And these are all with the Leica, I think. Yes, all done with the Leica. M3? Uh, I had, uh, I had an, believe it or not, I had an M5. Wow. Uh, yes, Mr. Exactly. Mr. Rockefeller here. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not that, it's that, that I was, I found a cheap at five and uh, because, um, I, I had, uh, you know, I was not precise with my uh, metering and I was upset with myself for not getting precise. I had the Luna 6 meter that I didn't use properly. Um, that was before the Minolta 3 cam, which was mechanical and wonderful uh, light meter, still available. I'm still using it. It's still very good. It's a flash, young flash, uh, cheap $100, $140. Uh, flash meter was excellent. And um, I, uh, uh, I use the M5 with that because it gave so, me a... So you're using the M5, you're shooting with a... The, the M5 for the, for the for difference between the M4 and the M5. The M5 have had the arm with the sensor as I give you a light meter. Uh, right. Uh, and you were able to... Uh, and so the problem is sometimes the, the arm of the light meter will not be working. So the the Minolta flash meter three, I think that came out like 80, 1980? Yeah, maybe 79, 80. 79, yeah. 80. And that was a game changer because it was an incident meter. It was a digital incident meter that yeah. uh, it, it gave you a reading down to a tenth of a stop, which for Kodachrome, well, no. that's, that's later on. That's later on. But first, you had you had a half stop. First, you had a half stop. Okay. And um and 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 then you got the, the other one was the by four, third, the Minolta by third, four, and then the following one was by ten. Okay. And by ten, you know, isn't when you have a Leica, sometimes your you your two hundred and fifty is is maybe one eighty, maybe. To 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 seven, it's not exact, you know. So I didn't need to have an exact thing. So as long as I I, I knew I you knew your camera, it. you had to know I, your camera. Because, I, you need to know your camera. You need right. to know your speed and all that, and you know how your film comes out, and you knew how to ex, ex, expose it. So with these, with the Leicas, with the Nikon's, with the Canons of the time, people didn't realize that, like you said, if you're at two fiftieth of a second to be within their specs, you could actually be a half second or a half halfway between 500th of a second or 125th of a second. And you'd still be in their specs as far as, uh, you know, being factory correct. 
So today we have third of a stop on everything and we're very precise. Back then you're shooting Kodachrome. You had to know your camera, you had to know your lens so that uh, you knew this camera, you could, you could, you know, open up maybe a third of a stop on your aperture and, and you'd, you'd be right with your exposure. Yeah, you need to know, you need to know, to know your film, you need to know your camera, because the film I, at the time I was ex exposing at 88, say, instead of 64. And um, you need to know what, you, what is it exactly you wanted to do. So you, you're, you're, you're exposing your Kodachrome at about a third of a stop uh, dark to start with. That's right. That's yeah. right. It gave me richer tone. It gave me, it's more full. The color are more intense. So you're working, you're working as, um, as an assistant in different photographer studios, and then you're shooting whenever you have the chance to shoot. And this is where this body of work comes from. This is, yes. This is pre-contact press images. Basically. That's right. Right. That's right. I was working as a cook in an Italian restaurant, <laughs> whatever was necessary, because at, I was working at night, or in the evening, and at night. So it gave me a chance, you know, to do any kind of work, you know. So to so to work in so to work in a photographer's studio and a kitchen in the food industry in New York in the seventies, you. Uh, you knew all the best places to hang out, basically. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, knew, I knew that's true. I was doing okay. I knew what to do. So that was great. That, that was a, New York was different at the time. It was, the city was little, but was in financial trouble. So it was wild. It was wild. And that's wild sense. That's what I like, you know. It was really nice and, and, and interesting time. Did you ever have, uh, I mean, you know, Anthony Bourdain was, uh, he was about a block it, away, his restaurant. Yeah. Was. Did I mean, you remember any interactions with him? Not really. He, he was, you know, he was just, uh, he, he was cooking steaks, you know, at the time. And, uh, and then he exploded after that. He became really good, you know. Very well, well. Our, our, our French restaurant was, it was also about a block away from the office, but it was on uh, it was on Madison. It was uh, the Abur, the eggplant, which was kind of like right in the same neighborhood, but it was more, it wasn't like the steak French restaurant. It was like more, um, um, what would you call that? Kind of common folk French food. Okay. Do you remember this place? Not really. Bob would eat there like three times a week and oh, okay. every time he'd go for two hours. I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know the appointment after that. Right. <laughs> What's uh, where's this scene? This is <laughs> that scene. Of, I see the, the Brooklyn bridge. Yes. It's a Fulton fish market. That was uh, all oh, right. Right. That was where the, they were selling the whole field uh, to the city. It was, uh, it was run by the, uh, by the uh, by the mafia, but as a fact, when you carry a camera down there, you all f often hear the Fed, the Fed. <laughs> they were talking about you. <laughs> no, so that's that was, right. That's right under the highway there, and that was like always a good place to make pictures. This is that's right. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is wonderful. That's in Coney Island. That's just regular Coney Island was pretty, uh, at the time, this boardwalk was completely destroyed, you know, it was right. really bad. <laughs> but it's, it's always nice, you know. There's always no, strong, strong things going on there. No, you've got this whole kind of uh, pop art uh, palette happening here. Your, your days of hanging out with Andy Warhol are showing. Oh, really? <laughs> This is Times Square before it was Times Square, I think. It's That's like 40 right. Second. That's right. I love this picture. That's that's a picture that was just, uh, I was at the house and was leaving to get the subway and there was a fire. And my neighbors, his, his, uh, this is a 
healthy uh, somebody that I know is a neighbor. So on my way to just a half a block from the half block from the uh, subway, there was this fire going on. So that's it, you know, so it took that picture. It's, so it's, it's, basically nothing was going on. You just saw this image come together. That's right. Yeah. And that's how you work basically, right? Yeah. When you're street photography, your yeah. street work. This is this is uh, the north side of Central Park. Where's this? No, this is in Central Park. It's, it, believe it or not, it's near 72nd Street or a little bit below. And at the time, Central Park was in really bad shape. And um, I love this little touch of red. And I didn't know if it would come out the way I saw it. And it did. So I was pretty happy about that. Nice. I don't, I don't know. I thought the film did a very good job. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the photographer did a pretty good job as well. This is back towards Times Square, I think. No, no, it's no? Herald uh, Square. It's uh, 34th Street, Street near Macy's. Um, it was just a bag of a, uh, of a department store. So it's passing in front of a blind. You know, it's you know, it just look. That's so funny. I mean, I was I was watching this uh, YouTube video the other day, and the photographers were shooting in that same location, 34th, and you know, across from Madison Square Garden. And I just thought to myself, that's like my least favorite part to shoot in New York City. That couple of blocks there, it's like very depressing. I mean, it's like it, very... it got better. It's different. <laughs> you have to go into the bars and all the places and it starts to get really interesting because there's a lot of bars and and it's it's uh it, yes it was it was it's 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 it, it's a lot more is happening if you start to get in um so this is really really a a good photograph and it 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 it, it, encap it 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 is new york of the 70s isn't it that's right even the font in sex world is like so like uh uh what was that west world font the uh, the 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 70s sci-fi font you know logan's run <laughs> i hate that font <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a depressing <laughs> font yeah it's not very successful font that for sure but you know, there's some light there. Yeah, it's just, uh, it just, I, th I never thought it would come out, and, uh, and, um, but I took it, and uh, uh, I took it, and uh, you know, it's a fraction of seconds because people come in and come out, uh, the light of the sun and the door open, and you know, you don't have that much sun uh, when that happened, you know. I mean that much time when uh, when they open the door and close the door, and it just uh, it, 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 I just guess the exposure, you know, and it worked out okay. And I think by scanning it, it comes out. Uh, if you projected uh, the slide, it, it comes out nice. But uh, on the slide, you know, it's really dense, so the scanning helps a little bit. Of course, it's beautiful. Oh, this is one of your, um, this is a famous image of yours, really. It's a, almost Probably. a signature image that's <laughs> non-news related, that's actually lovely to look at. It's just a beautiful image. It's just, there was a two or three uh, row of, uh, of uh, uh, it was National Memorial Guard. Day. Oh, yeah, okay. National Guard, right. And the sun eat right on the lips of that woman <laughs> it's like i mean it's amazing it was amazing and you know it's i, I may have like three or four frame of it i tried to do it better but as soon she moved you know it was not right you know no it's there and then it's gone and yeah and right. you shoot this today and, and you're you're almost like oh i have to bring up the shadow levels and get a little detail in there no and... no 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 yeah, it's just no. Yeah, it's not on the film. Anyhow, on the on the Kodachrome. No, it doesn't. It doesn't exist in Kodachrome. It's not. Yeah. It's just. But and that's the beauty of it. It's it's yeah. 
it's mysterious and it's it's a uh, it's an image that uh that has has a, a beauty and a mystery to itself that exists on its own level it doesn't it doesn't need any explanation it's just beautiful the elevated trains i know you wrote a lot of elevated trains <laughs> yeah that's in queens like it's i don't know i found that uh... it's a, this is a really well crafted image as well i think i think the spot here if you look to your left you see you'd see the world trade center from a long way away uh, I don't think so because I'm no? looking on, on, on the other direction. I'm looking north. <laughs> You're looking Trade north, Center. but if you and look... I'm in Queens and I'm Queens. Oh, I'm thinking and Brooklyn. And yeah. it and it no, it's Queens Plaza and it's uh, and it's a little bit far. Okay. You may have some building, but uh, yeah. I love this. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Nice. That's that's uh I don't know if you remember we had that an office with Woodfin Camp on Madison Avenue. And oh right, right. And we uh, we, we had the uh, the stock images there. And right. there was a storm over Rockefeller Center. And uh I was there and I, I went I went out on the, on the window and I took that picture. There was very few seconds that it changed because there's a lot of wind, so the the things changed, but it was really dark for a few few minutes. It was really nice. This is the type of image that uh Woodfin Camp would make a lot of money on. <laughs> <laughs> and this is from our other office. That's right. At the view from Central Park West. It's just, I mean, it's just so, we took it for granted. We didn't, I, I, I mean, maybe you didn't, but I just thought that's what everybody's view in New York City looked like. <laughs> I didn't know. What I, I was coming from Nebraska. What did I know? That's right. But, you know, in the building, there was Mick Jagger, Jimmy Connors, Mia Farrow, you know, all these people. You know, no, it, it, to to walk that... out to walk out in front of that building, it was like uh, walking through '70s Hollywood. The auteurs you'd see, uh, um, Warren Beatty, you'd see uh, uh, Woody yeah. Allen. Yeah, no, they, he, he they was coming every, every day. He was right. there every day, right. and uh, and next door was uh, was uh, Yoko Ono and uh, John Lennon. Half a block down. Yeah, and, and very often we had, uh, when we had lunch, uh, they some, we'll share a burger with his son or whatever. We, they were next to us, you know. Right. And who, uh, so who has this apartment now? I think you know. Uh, what, uh, De Niro, is it her? Yeah. I, De Niro, Robert, yeah. So this is Robert De Niro's view at this point. Yeah. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is, this is, so this is t the Times Square that, uh, that us older folks realize that uh, this is when it was still a little rough around Times Square. Yes, yes. A, a it different was, New York. It had been rough for a long time, you know. Yeah. For at least, I mean, yeah. That's, that's a beautiful image, Frank. So tell me when this, this show is at the Leica Gallery in San Francisco. It's uh, the show is uh, I think the picture is already there uh, mounted and the, sh the show um, uh, the show is uh, until I think February twenty nine. When's it open? In the open on uh, Thursday the twenty third. Thursday the twenty third. So it it's... is the opening opening okay. day. And Six you're, you're 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 going to be there. I will be there. Yeah, okay. flying tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Frank. I'm giving a workshop there. Oh, you got a workshop too? Yes, what? a workshop uh, uh, Saturday and Sunday and a Friday afternoon. What's the workshop going to be? Street photography? It, it's about visual, uh, visual freedom, a little bit of street photography, but also visual freedom, trying to help people 
um, make create a view. your own. I'm sorry. Make a view. Uh, trying trying to, to help people make a view. Yeah. <laughs> No, but trying to make them put them on the path of 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 being themselves. Very often, people are too much uh, trying to be somebody else, and and it's so much more interesting when they are themselves. That's so true. And well, so, uh, so that basically the goal is trying to help them. And there's different kind of people. There's staff who give workshop in Mexico. Uh, David Coleman. <laughs> uh, he. Uh, uh, it comes and uh, and there's also photographer who give a wedding and uh, events uh, photographer. So there's all kind of uh, people and uh, so for, should work. I'm already in touch with them and already working with them. Uh, they gave me the list uh, a week ago, so I'm already in connection with them and working with them. Already. I think I, I think I had this I had this workshop with you years ago. And it was basically like this. You said, you take the Leica, you put it up to your face, you make a view, voila, there you have it. <laughs> Something like that. It's almost that, yeah. That's it. Well, thank you, Frank. I just, you're just a treasure, and I, and I love you so much. And I just, thank you very much, Ken. It's very nice of you to do that. Thank you. I, I wish I could be at your show. Otherwise, good luck. Have Thanks a great again. Time. Okay.